Open your Bible, if you have it, to Romans chapter 1. Today we're going to talk about faith again. We read last time in Hebrews 10 that uh, the just shall live by faith. That means the righteous live by faith. The Christians live by faith. And then we have to define faith because sometimes people think faith is this invisible thing that people hang on to during tough times. But faith is not an invisible thing. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. Faith is a, a tangible thing that you must grasp. And if you don't feel it in your spirit, you ain't got it. Tangible, tangible bridge to the miraculous. Tangible bridge to the supernatural walk with God. Amen. This life on earth must be lived by faith. If not, it's going to be boring. The Christian that tries to live his life without walking by faith, because it can happen. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you're walking by faith. Doesn't mean you're living your, doesn't mean you're living your life by faith. Amen. Christians that try to live any other way but by faith are bored. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Yes, that's true. Come on. Bored, worldly, and frustrated. Come on. <laughs> it's the truth. If you think all your solutions are of life are going to be worldly and not supernatural, where you get answers from heaven that blows open the earth. If you think you're going to live like that, you're going to be bored. Probably backslide for too long. So Christian, you need to learn how to live by faith. That's why we come to church, so we can learn some of these things, so we can have a fruitful life. Living by faith is exciting. Walking by faith and seeing miracles happen is necessary if we're, if we're going to be fed in the earth, if we're going to be sustained in the earth, if we're going to be happy in the earth. Now most of you were trained for years, decades, scores of lives, scores of years. Trained in the world's way. Trained in carnality. Trained in natural reasoning. But when you get saved, you have the opportunity to go to the Bible and find out the new way to live. Amen. The new way to live. Amen. Hallelujah. Matter of fact, Paul's Romans 1. Put your finger there, but go to uh, 1 John chapter 5. I want to read something to you from the Message Bible. 1 John chapter 5. This will kick it off here. You've got to have a goal. You've got to have a reason for these things. Amen. You know, if you're a millionaire, then you don't have to do a whole lot of stressing out about tomorrow's food, do you? If you're a millionaire, you don't have to stress out about tomorrow's food. So, you're not going to be, if you're a millionaire, you're not going to be using your faith for tomorrow's fried chicken on the table. But if you ain't got any money, you're going to have to use your faith to get fried chicken on the table. Or baked chicken, some of you health folks, whatever. <laughs> Got to relate to everybody, you know. Talk about fried chicken or pizza or Coke and half the crowd says, oh, he's one of those unholy eaters. <laughs> Talk about eating eggs and bacon, like, oh, yep, he's one of those bacon eaters. That's right, I am. You got it. You got it. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> so the millionaire in the area of finances... He's going to have to find a way to use his faith for something. Amen. He can't just kick back, you know, if you won the lottery, which you're never going to win it because you don't play it, right? I mean, Christians don't play the lottery, do they? Well, well. Out of the corner of my eye, I can see everybody. <laughs> I told you all to quit playing the lottery. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Save you 10 bucks, give it to God. Yes. Amen. You know, I told a fellow that at the cash register one time. He's buying all these lottery tickets. I said, you know, you'd make more money if you give it to God. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, you're right. <laughs> so the millionaire, even though he doesn't have to worry about the, the food on the table net tomorrow, he's going to have to do something by faith or he won't be living by it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you did somehow get a windfall, you don't just kick back, quit your job and, you know, and add more cable channels. <laughs> you need to produce, you need to serve, you need to... Uh, you need to increase, you need to grow, you need to achieve, you need to overcome, you need to win. And if you've done one, then help somebody else win. That's right. Thank you, Jesus. First John chapter 5, verse 4 says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Now let me read it from the Message Bible. It says this, Every God-begotten person conquers the world's ways. Glory. Hallelujah. Yeah. You know, you got troubles, and they, they never come from God. Troubles don't come from God. 
People get real weird about it. They're like, some trouble comes, like, well, I guess God wants this for some reason. I guess this some some divine destiny, some plan, some sovereign thing God's got going to fix me and test, test me and teach me and work with me and make me better and prove that I, I, I love him. People get real weird about it, but it's not true. No, God's not giving you troubles. The world's giving you troubles, and the devil's giving you troubles, and if that wasn't enough, you give yourself troubles. I taught a message, a whole series in there, about 33% of your troubles come from the devil. 33% of your troubles come from the world, and the other 33% of your troubles you're making yourself. Okay. The Message Bible says this, The power that brings the world to its knees is our faith. Whoa. Woo. I like that. You got troubles? Your faith can bring them to their knees. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. It's either that or you're going to have to wait a long time. That's right. Either that or you're going to have to flip some coins and cross some superstitious fingers. Mm -hmm. Christians do that all the time. Christians do that all the time. Rather than use faith, rather than apply the principle of faith that we're going to talk about today, many Christians will do the, Chris, do the superstitious thing, which is, well, in Jesus' name, I've prayed, and so I hope, I'm hoping that God answers. Oh, I'm just, I, I just, I, you know. And in their consciousness, they're thinking, oh, I'm a child of God, and I know He, I know he loves me, and I know, he, I know that good things are supposed to happen to, to Christians, and, and so I just hope they happen. And the Christian just it becomes just as superstitious as the rest of the world. Yeah. 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 Going. The foundation is that, yeah, you're a child of God and He loves you and He's ready to take you on and bless you and help you. But there's more to it. Yeah. There, you need some substance. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the bridge to get you there. And if you don't have the bridge, you ain't getting there. Yeah. Amen. 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 All right. <clears throat> Turn back to Romans. Chapter 1. We'll talk about the principle of faith today, the law of faith, the word of faith. These are all terms from the Bible that if you don't understand them, you can't apply them. If you don't understand the laws and principles of faith, you can't apply them. And all you do is you just kind of keep the, uh, the uh, Hollywood view of faith or the, 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 the nominal Christian out there, the denominational aspect of faith, which is my overall general Christian belief system. Mm -hmm. Well, my faith is going to carry me through. Mm -hmm. mm, you don't see that in the Bible said that way. Rather, in the Bible, what you have is individual incidents where a catastrophe was averted because of a firm stance of belief yes. Yes. on a specific outcome. For a specific hour, for God's hand to do something in a specific way at a specific moment to save me, deliver me, set me free. Yeah. That's what faith is. Faith can save your family from poverty. Faith in God's promise in the Bible about prosperity, faith that God will provide, faith that God will increase. Faith that God will never let you go a day without eating, mm -hmm. unless you're fasting. Mm -hmm. Faith in what God has said about those things is what gets you through it and allows God to work a miracle. Really? Yes. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. And the American. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Yes. Or we could say the Christian shall live by his faith. That means the Christian shall live by what he believes. It means the Christian shall live by his trust in God to come through for him every day. His absolute confidence in His Holy Father to sustain Him, to help Him overcome, to answer His prayer, to keep Him, to lead Him, to guide Him, to help Him overcome and achieve victory every day of His life. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. 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 
Turn to Romans chapter 10. <clears throat> Faith is trusting in advance what will only make sense in reverse. I didn't make that up, but it sounds good, doesn't it? Somebody else said that. Now, next time I use it, it'll be mine. It'll be... You know how we do that, right? The first time you got to give acknowledgement who said it. Then the next time you just say, well, somebody said it. And then the next time you say, well, I always say. <laughs> Which God doesn't have a problem with that. Because he likes us to quote him and then he likes us to believe it for ourselves. And he likes us to take it on and, right. and act, like, act like it's true no matter who said it. Right. Right. Hallelujah. Yeah. Faith is not belief without proof. But it's trust without reservation. Without uncertainty, without doubt, without hesitation, without double-mindedness. That's what faith is. Faith does not have double-mindedness. Now, we hadn't read it. We may do this at, at some point because we're going to be talking about faith for a while because it's time for us to launch together. It's time for us to grab hold of some things or re-grab and recognize, you know what? This, this existence requires faith. If I'm going to please God in life, I'm going to have to learn how and do trust Him. That's right, that's right. I'm going to have to plan on some things happening by faith. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's almost like we, if we're in a crisis, it's like, oh yes, I need some faith. I want faith. I'm going to use my faith to get a miracle. If we're not in crisis, it's like, whew, I'm so glad I don't have to do anything spiritual. <laughs> but I want you to know this, that faith unchallenged ain't faith at all. That's right. Faith will always have a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. So if we're going to please God by faith, we're going to have to have some challenges. The Christian life is not about achieving some place where you never have challenges again. That's right. That's right. It's like I talk about the millionaire, you know, just because he doesn't have to worry about food tomorrow, he needs to do something by faith. Mm -hmm. He needs to make sure God's his source. Yeah. Right. I came out of the business world, and when I was in the business world, that was when I transitioned from, you know, ungodly to godly life. And during that, I became godly, and all of a sudden, I found out all these truths about God, and I had to take an assessment, and I thought, you know what? I don't really look at God as my source of income, mm -hmm. because I've, I've got plenty. That's right. I have a great job. My employer, I mean, they put my paycheck in the bank, and I trust them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Isn't that right? Uh -huh. And I thought, ah, how am I going to do this? And you don't have to quit your job to live by faith. Please, please, matter of fact, don't quit your job to think you're going to live by faith. I thought, I better start practicing now. I better start stretching myself now. I better start getting a, a mental picture of God being my source. Amen. He has provided this. He's the reason I'll get promoted. Yeah. Not because my boss thinks I'm great. Not because of a fancy email I sent out. Mm -hmm. Come on. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's good news, especially in reverse, that if... You didn't send an email out that was fancy and perfect. Then you think, well, I guess I won't get the promotion because I just can't type like it. You know, you come up with some reason why you can't get it. It has nothing to do with it. When you trust God, promotion comes from Him, not from the East or the West. So I, I, mean, I remember practicing trusting God to be my source. My reason for prosperity is my promises from God. Amen? That's using your faith. You've got to practice these things. Faith must be practiced. Faith must be used. Faith must shoot the target. All right. Romans chapter 10. Are you there? Romans chapter 10. Here's the, the basis. Here's uh, the foundation of this principle or law of faith. It says this. Verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Notice how faith has the word attached to it. Notice how this term or this phrase, word of faith, is used in Scripture. Verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Now that's the word of faith. That's what faith is. You can't walk by faith in God until you've passed through verse 8 and 9. Right. Passing through verse 8 and 9 has to do with you believing in your heart something particular. In the case of salvation, believing that God raised Jesus from the dead. And then that's not enough, is it? 
twiddling your thumbs thinking how much you believe doesn't solve the crisis, does it? The sinner is still unsaved even though he may believe in his heart. He's not saved until he says it with his mouth. So this first great miracle of salvation that is the doorway into the life of faith comes by believing in your heart without doubting and saying it with your mouth. For with the heart, the next scripture, man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. With the heart, man believes unto the goal. With the mouth, confession is made to the solidifying of that goal. Make sense? So the first miracle takes place by believing something in your heart without doubting, and then saying it with your mouth out loud, and then bam, you're saved. To get food on the table means believing something particular in your heart about God, maybe, one or, maybe two or three of His promises about taking care of your financial obligations, and saying it out of your mouth, and then bam, there's food on the table. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Can it happen like that? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's where supernatural things uh, override natural things. Amen. Amen. And that's, what we're that's all we're talking about. And you know, as good as I do, that every single one of us in here likes that kind of stuff. Right. If they made magic wands, or if wiggling your nose could work, if you could purchase for the low, low price of $2,000 the ability to wiggle your nose and make your house get clean, you'd do it. Because we love supernatural stuff. We're made that way. God put that in us. He's a supernatural. Who you think dreamed up all the miracles? That's right. He loves it. Amen. And we're just like him, so we love it. That's right. Amen. To find out that a Christian can actually lay hands on a sick person and see the oh, sick yeah. person well is kind of fun. Oh, yeah. So when are you going to start admitting it and come to healing school? Amen. See what I mean? We're just going to have you, but, but, but we're relegated to this carnal earth which the carnal world is natural. Uh -huh. yes. The carnal world is natural and we're stuck. Because of this dirt we live in, we're stuck to the dirt. O only the Christian who is born again, spiritualized, empowered by the Spirit, that's the only way to jump out of this dirt and have a miracle happen. Hallelujah. That's good. Come on. We like that kind of stuff, don't we? Yeah. Then, then you got you to explain what a miracle is. You know, some people look at the sun come up and say, oh, that's a miracle. <laughs> no, that's natural. That's a natural part of this earth that is, is, is happens every day, whether you think it or not, whether you like it or not. It, it's going to happen because it's natural. Now, God started it all, and that was supernatural. Yeah. But that's a natural part of this earth life. Seasons are part of this earth. That's natural. Uh -huh. What was a miracle is when Joshua stopped the sun. Amen. Now, that's a miracle. Yes. See? A miracle is the supernatural intervention into the ordinary course of nature. A miracle is the supernatural intervention into the mind of your boss. A miracle, and those, those, those don't happen just because God loves you. Those don't happen just because you need some extra cash. Those happen because you have some serious faith that makes a bridge for you to touch the supernatural. Thank you, Jesus. Keep going. Praise the Lord. Amen. Glory. So, turn your Bible with me, maybe somewhere else. We've got other scriptures, you know. Go to 2 Corinthians with me. The law of faith is this. It's really the law of what is heavenly supersedes the law of what is natural. Amen. Yeah, I understand natural progression and natural... Uh, biology, natural economics, or such. Yeah. The law of faith supersedes it. Yeah. The law of, of faith can supersede the, the natural things. The example that's easy to see is the law of gravity is very natural. The law of lift is natural, but here's a good example. The law of lift supersedes the law of gravity. 
It makes no sense that a huge airliner sitting on a runway could then be in the air because gravity says no way. But if you find a new law, if you find another law, which they didn't find for 5,000 years, right? No, 5,900 years. 5,900 years went by and no one knew of the law of lift. Well, Christians have been living a long time believing in Jesus, not understanding the law of faith, so they can't override natural things with miracle working power. That's true. That's good. The law of lift allows you to override the law of gravity. But it doesn't happen in the blink of an eye. It doesn't happen with the flick of the finger. It doesn't happen by sitting on the runway thinking, oh, I believe it all. <laughs> Come on. And for the Christian, you need to recognize that having miracles in your life Having God intervene in your life doesn't happen because you sit there thinking, I believe He will, I believe He could, and I, I believe He loved me, and I'm just so happy about that. And I went to church and I believed everything they said. Miracles don't happen that way. Your wheels ought to be turning just to make sure we're on the right page here. Is that true? Miracles don't happen because you sit there believing it. Sick people, sick Christians on their, on their bed believing in healing. I believe it. There's sinners sitting at home believing in Jesus. Yes, yes. Mom, mom took them to church when they were a kid. They believed in the resurrection. Unsaved as can be. Can that happen? Yes. Is it possible for a Christian to lay there sick, believing something? Believe in the, the, the details of divine healing? Is it possible? Yeah, it happens all the time. What's needed besides just believing? I got, I got faith, I believe it. Action. Believe in your heart and say it with your mouth. Could it be that simple? Yeah, it's that simple. Now, half of you sitting there thinking, well, I'll try that one time. And I don't know. Why. <laughs> no, no, it's a principle. It's a law, but it takes a little effort. Yes. You can't sit there on the one runway and fly. You can't just look at the plane and examine the plane and believe in the plane. It takes some effort. You're going to have to fuel that plane. You're going to have to push a few buttons. You might even have to go to school and learn how to push those buttons. I would suggest that. You're going to have to push the right buttons at the right time, and you're going to have to pull that throttle at the right time, and you're going to have to use some effort. And it's kind of, the first time you fly is kind of scary, isn't that right? The first time, even though you've learned, the first time you go after something to override the natural principle of gravity and get yourself up in that air, it's kind of intimidating. You need an instructor. Overriding, an, overriding one law is kind of intimidating. Because it goes against natural thought. It goes against natural reasoning. It goes against the human carnal nature. There you go. Uh -huh. But that's where the glory is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. The excitement and the glory is when that pilot takes his first lift off and he's up there doing it himself. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the Christian. The glory is when that Christian contacts the power of God through faith Hallelujah. and overrides some natural thing like a common fever. Mm -hmm. Now that's fun. Hallelujah. Amen. Where did I tell you to turn to? Oh, yeah. Second Corinthians chapter 4. Uh, so thank God we all believe the truth here. I know every one of you believe the truth. I won't have you raise your hand to prove it. If you believe the Bible, raise your hand. I know you all would. We're not talking about believing the truth. That's the first step, though. You're going to have to know the truth and believe the truth. You're going to have to know that there's something like this. You're going to have to know what God has said. You're going to have to believe what God has said. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 says that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And then if He hears us, we know that we have the petition we desire of Him. So to get petitions answered from heaven takes more than just... Oh, God, if you, if you want it, then do it in Jesus' name. No, if you ask according to His will, that means you must know His will, which means you must know His Word. So if you know His Word, then you can pray right and get your prayer answered. 
And if you don't know his word, that means you don't know what God has said. You can't trust him for it. Isn't that right? Yeah. <clears throat> I'd like to give somebody some money today. I'd like to give somebody some money today. It's my will to give somebody this $20 bill. It's my will. I'm a, good God, I'm a good preacher. I'm a good pastor. I love to bless people. I don't know what's wrong with them, but I will take it. Thank you. You said it, and I've got it. They're all looking at us like, well, it stayed in the family. It didn't count. It's my will. But somebody's got to take it from me. Somebody's got to believe it enough. Believe me enough that I'm not going to stiff arm you when you come get it. I mean, she started talking before she came. She started saying it before she got up here. I'm getting it. I'm taking it. I mean, that's her confession. She believed it. She came with her confession and got it. Amen? Amen. Now some of you are mad at her because she did it. <laughs> Christians do that all the time. They get mad because so-and-so got the blessing and they didn't. Well, they just got all loud about it. You know, that's why they got it. No, she followed the principle, which is, I believe that. I'd like that. I'm going to get that. When the Bible says you can be healed and you can have all your needs met and you can be prosperous and successful and have joy today and peace today, some people say, oh, I sure wish it happened to me. Other people say, I'm getting it. Must be true. I'm getting it. And she didn't have 20 bucks for 15 steps. Took her 15 steps. Maybe not. Maybe seven. Maybe eight steps to get it. She didn't have it for eight steps on her journey to get it. The Christian may have a few steps in between here and there. You know, we don't have magic noses. We have to follow the principle of faith. The plane doesn't just start from here and zip upward. I know you military guys are thinking, yeah, but they got those new F whatevers. No, it has, it has bottom force going. And it doesn't just happen. It takes a few seconds. To get off that runaway takes a while. I'm, I'm following the principle. I'm following the principle. I'm following the principle. I'm doing it. 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 The book said if I just get up to this speed. The book said. So I'm getting there and I'm getting there and I'm getting there. And bam. There I go. Yep. Same thing with the law of faith. Hallelujah. It's not just to wiggle the nose and no, say it one time and, you know, throw your little salt over the shoulder and keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> That superstition, don't, don't use it as superstition. Christians have tried that, don't work. No, you hang in there and you say the truth and you confess the truth and you mean it like, you say it like you mean it and you grit down and you ignore what people are saying and you turn off the TV and you do whatever is necessary to get yourself into a place of faith. Amen. I want you to realize that faith and receiving answers from God has nothing to do with you convincing God of anything. That's right. It has everything to do with you convincing you. Amen. Yeah. That's all it is. You have to convince you that it's all true. Well, I, the Lord knows. I believe it. No, He knows you don't. He knows you're trying to believe it. He knows that you'd like to believe it, and in theory that you do believe it. He knows that, but He knows you don't fully believe it. Because if you fully believed it, you'd be in the air. That's right. That's right. That's true. Amen. Amen. Faith has everything to do with you confessing Scripture, thinking on it, pursuing it, persevering, determined, grasping yes. the substance long enough with a grit in your teeth and, and a stare like you wouldn't believe. Mm -hmm. I'm getting this promise. You That's watch right. and see. That's, right. Amen. Amen. That's what faith is. Amen. And then all of a sudden, Hanging on. I'm convinced. Amen. All of a sudden, I can walk around telling all of you, God will come through for me. You That's watch right. and see. That's right. Amen. 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 Yeah. Not, well, I'm believing for a miracle. Everybody believe for a miracle. If we need a miracle here. Doesn't that sound desperate and doubtful? Yes. Have you heard it before? Oh, yeah. yeah. And it just, it's just evidence that we don't have true, absolute, unreserved confidence in God. And it's not for you to finger point at each other. Nope. It's for you to look in the mirror and assess yourself. Come on. 
The Bible says to test yourself. Yes. Examine yourself whether you be in the faith. Amen. Amen. That's right. And that can mean the general overall lifestyle of obedience toward God, or it can also mean the specific, are you in the faith concerning this matter? Are you really trusting concerning this matter? Do you have some double-mindedness? James chapter 1 says mm -hmm. that if you're going to ask from God anything, you better ask in faith, not wavering. For he that wavers is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For, net, for let not that, that's backward speak with the King James, don't let that man think he shall receive anything from the Lord. Yep. Yeah. Come on. If you're double-minded, you won't get it. That's right. If you're uncertain, you won't get it. I'll just tell you right now. If you show up at the office for some extra counseling, I'll just tell you face to face, if I see doubt and, and, and double-mindedness, you won't get it that way. That'll stop some of the counseling sessions, don't you think? When I see double-mindedness come and try to get prayer, it's difficult for me. Now, sometimes I can override it and sometimes I can, you know, blast the unbelief out enough to, to get the answer in. But other times I just have to give the sympathy prayer. And then coach and say, come back, let, come back another time. You need another time. You need to realize that that's part of this life. It's not just wiggle the nose. Let's see if the pa And if your nose, well, my nose don't wiggle. Maybe the pastor's nose will wiggle for me. Get me a miracle. Mm -hmm. So you come up and get the wiggle, and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. come on. And then it's like, well, I guess God didn't want to do anything. You know, the pastor's nose didn't work either. <laughs> Sometimes it, you have to recognize, you know, I need to, come, I need to really get serious about it. I, I need to get in there. I, I need to go back. Amen. I need to address some things. I need to let him help me. I need to get some CDs. I need to read some books. I need to seek the Lord. I need to really get down in this thing rather than just try to get some pixie dust to help me. Now, every once in a while, wink sneak miracles on people that aren't even hardly expecting them. But most of the time, you're going to have to do something different. And when the pastor tells you to come back, you ought to at least think about it. The doctor tells you to come back and you just, oh, you do anything for the doctor. The pastor tries to give you a spiritual answer. Come back. I'm going to help you some more. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And you get busy. I'm too, I'm too busy. I, I'll just. Keep going. Keep going. And then we wonder how come it doesn't work. How come, right. it don't, how come so and so and how come him and how come her. I know she had faith. Look at her. She's always here. Come on. Keep going. No, you don't have any clue about her. You don't have any clue what's in her heart. You don't know what issues of conscience she has. You don't know what doubts she may have. You don't have any clue if she's in faith or not. You have no clue. Well, now I know she knows the Bible. She quotes all the scriptures. She leads Bible studies. You ought to see her in church. She's there every Sunday. I think she's there. In a, I'm not there every Sunday, but I think she is. <laughs> and then here she had a catastrophe. How come God didn't help her? Huh, huh, huh? You don't have any clue about other people. It doesn't matter what they look like. It doesn't matter what you've seen in their life or ministry, even preachers. You have no clue what's in their heart. Issues of conscience is what we deal with. Amen. You all deal with how you know, carnal you feel. You all deal with how you, uh, disappointments. You, you all deal with, well, I just don't know if I could do it like him. I mean, he said he quoted something for three and a half hours. I don't know if I can do that. You deal with that kind of stuff. You know, you, you hear the testimony of 15 minutes, and it's like, oh, that's not too bad. You hear the testimony of four hours or five weeks, and you're like, oh, is it going to take me that long? You deal with those things. Doing spiritual things by faith, it ain't the snap of the finger, it's not the wiggle of the nose, it takes a little effort. Mm -hmm. It really does. It doesn't have to take long, it's just serious effort. Yes. Sincere, let's say it that way, sincere effort. The times you've heard me tell about being healed or delivered or some miracle, they were sincere effort. Sometimes, sometimes very quick, sometimes 15, sometimes three and a half, sometimes a few weeks. The very sincere effort. Very determined, very settled that, you know, this promise of God must come to pass for me. He promised it. It's my job to receive it. He threw the pass. I've got to catch it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. And you can do anything. You can overcome anything. You can have anything from God. All things are possible to him that believes. Yeah. All things are possible with God. Everybody knows that. Everybody in Christianity knows that all things are possible with God. But they don't all realize that all things are possible to him who believes. Yes. Uh -huh. oh, yes. You have to believe it without any doubt. Amen? Amen? And sometimes it just takes a little time for you to believe it without doubt. Back in July, we were teaching on uh, some of these things. And during the message, we had a tongue and interpretation. And this is what it said. This is what God said. 
through the tongues and interpretation. He said, find the word, find the word, and don't lose the word. Hang on to it. Find the word. Find the word that you need. Find the word for yourself. Find the word and don't lose it and I'll bring it to pass for you. His word is settled in heaven. This is where he transitions into coming from, the earth, coming from me. His word is settled in heaven. Thy word, O Lord, is settled in heaven. And I saw that so clearly. When we find it, it's done. When we get it, heaven and earth meet. When we find it, then it's settled in earth. It's already settled in heaven, but when we find it, it's settled on earth. Heaven has a will. God has a mind. He has a desire. He has a want to. He has a certain destiny. He has a plan and purpose for you. He has given you promises. It's already established what He wants for you. He wants you to live a long life in the earth. But until you find that promise and accept that promise and settle that it's going to happen for you, it won't happen necessarily. It'll be the flip of a coin, the cross of a finger. See if you get to live long. I'm telling you, the faith life will enable you to uh, have your protection detail with you at all times. You know, you hire bodyguards. You got your protect. Pro Did you know that we have protection detail? I think she talked about angels last week. Have you ever seen my protection detail? If you had seen my protection detail, you'd never worry for me ever. I did that one time I, when I was first learning some of these things. You know, you have to recognize areas in your life uh, where you need a little, where you need God. Yes. Where you need God to be your rear end, your rear reward. Where you, where you need God to be your encompass around about like a shield. Mm -hmm. yeah. Isn't that right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You need to recognize where you have fears and worries and dreads and uncertainties. You have to recognize these areas. And then you have to address these areas. Amen. Amen. The walk of faith, the life of faith is not, well, I got it and he don't got it. Well, I wish I had it. It's not just chance that you have faith. Exactly. You have to get it. You have to address these areas of, of your conscience that are insecure. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you have to build something in there to fill that gap and that void. Well, what you build is the Word of God in there. So you need to read Psalm 91 and find out about God promising protection for you. Yeah, we got a whole series in there, Divine Protection and Long Life. If you, if you want to live long and be protected, get it. Amen. Well, I just don't know if I need that. I don't know. No, no. <laughs> People do that all the time. It's like, the answer's right here, but there's just no effort. No effort. Well, I hope I live long. Christian will walk out of a service about divine protection and long life thinking, well, I sure hope I live a long time. I think I picked on just about everybody today. <clears throat> but I, I established, I figured it out. And I got in the Bible and I, and I put it in my heart. I planted that word in my heart and I said it and said it and said it until I actually believed it. That nothing can, can by any means hurt me. Amen. I can stand up and tell you, nothing shall by any means hurt me. Yes. Right. Amen. Right. There's got to be somebody in here thinking, oh, he shouldn't have said that. You know how the devil is. The devil will jump on him now that he said that. No, he, matter of fact, he's the one that needs to hear me say that. I'd rather keep it to myself, but I'll tell you just so you maybe you could go there. But I decided that Luke 10, 19 was true and Psalm 91 was true. I decided it. I settled it. I got that word from heaven and I put it in me and I settled it in the earth. It's going to happen in my life. The only way that it wouldn't happen is if I did something really dumb. But this is how I practiced it. One of, one of the first times I remember practicing it, I, was, uh, I went out to go buy a lawnmower. I had my pickup truck back then. Went and bought a lawnmower. And in a box, you know. And I was coming home and ready to mow the yard or whatever. And I decided I needed to stop by Home Depot. I think I bought it at Sears. I was headed home. I went to stop by Home Depot. And I thought, but I got this lawnmower in the back of my pickup truck and... Honey, is the door locked tonight? Come on. We're all in bed, but what if? <laughs> you know, that's true. Keep going. 
There's another. I used to practice that. When I would wonder, in, my, in laying in bed, I would wonder, is the door locked? I'd think, wait a second. Wait a second. I don't know. I'd, I'd, I'd rather it locked, but if it's not locked, I'm not going to get up. I'm going to trust God. And I would ask the Lord and just talk to Him about it. No need to be afraid. I mean, what? Did God say, I will protect you as long as your door is locked? No. <laughs> no evil shall befall you. No one's going to hurt you uh, as long as your door is locked. And you know, somebody's going to get mad at me and go home and say, he doesn't believe in locking doors. <laughs> no, I'm telling you how to overcome some things in your soul and, and res resolve some things about God. I figure my angel, my, 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 my guardian angel is going to work whether I got my door locked or not. Now, maybe locking your door will keep the goofball from coming in in the first place. But if he did come in, I'd just look at him and say, what you need? I got a track. All I know for sure is he can't hurt me and my family. All I know is he can't hurt me. He can't, he can't destroy me. He can't hurt me. No evil shall befall me. If he did anything wrong, it'd be evil, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Keep going. So I used to sit there and practice. And, and for a while, there's this intimidation factor, and it's like, nope, 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 I'm not going to think about it, not going to think about it, not going to think about it. And I'd fight it in Jesus, and I'd quote Scripture at it in Jesus' name. No, 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 God's going to protect me. My whole yard's secure in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Okay, that's it. I'm not going to worry. Now shut up. I ain't worried about it. Ha, ha, I'm not worried about it. And I'd go to sleep. And I practice, and all of a sudden... After a month or two, all of a sudden, I could almost see the angels in the yard. I could almost see. Now, in my, spiritual, in my spirit, I could see it. I could tell. I was protected. Glorious. Then I had to coach everybody else. I, it's okay. We're protected. Amen. That's right. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Jesus. Hallelujah. So I'm driving home from getting the lawnmower, and I had to stop by Home Depot, and I thought, well... I don't want to leave it in the back of the pickup, you know, because somebody might steal it. It'd be smarter to drop it off. So I was going to go home and, drive and, and, and waste 20 minutes going back to the house, drop it off, come back to Home Depot. And I thought, well, I could save myself 20 minutes. That'd be good. And I said, Lord, I'm just going to ask you to protect it for me. Thanks. So would you do that for me? He said, I would. Amen. And I said, okay, and I parked, and I locked, locked the car, left the thing in the back, and I'm walking, and I'm just praying. And I just said, Lord, in Jesus' name, I... Ask you to protect it. Don't let anybody steal it for me. In Jesus' name. He said, if you ask anything in my name, I'll do it for you. John 16, 23. Anything you ask the Father in my name, he would give it to you. Well, I just need a little divine protection for a moment. Just for a little brief, you know, shopping deal. And so, after I prayed in Jesus' name, I knew the Father would give it to me. But I wanted to look back and make sure. And I, I, I made myself not look backwards. Amen. I made myself. Oh, I wanted to look back and just double check. Keep going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell the truth. See? We're all natural people. You're going to have to fight the natural side. Yes. Come on. You know, if you just mentally ascend to some of these things, you'll be the one sitting there saying, well, I know it's supposed to happen, but I sure wish it happened for me. The faith person who has it in their heart says, it's mine, I've got it, and that settles it. Amen. Amen. So I forced Amen. myself to trust God. You got to do that. You got to force yourself to trust him on him alone. So I walk in and got bought my other thing, whatever I need, and came back out. You know, I'm happy. I, I broke the fear. You got to break the fear. If you do that right, you'll break the power of the devil. You'll break the fear and intimidation. So I'm walking back out to the truck and expecting my lawnmower to be there. Well, it was. Praise the Lord. And as I'm walking up to the pickup truck, the, the parking lot attendant, she's walking down the aisle, and she sees me headed to my pickup truck. And she says, sir, is that your pickup truck with that lawnmower in the back? She said, you should have, somebody's going to steal that thing. And I just kept walking. I said, no, you hadn't seen my guardian angel, have you? <laughs> just a little simple thing like that. But you've got to start somewhere. You've got to kill the lion and the bear before you reach Goliath. You can't just hope that Goliath never shows up. You got to start beating the little guys. Amen. Come on. And that enabled me to go out and minister in the ghettos of America, in the danger zones of, mm -hmm. of Houston. Mm -hmm. We were in the worst spots of Houston. We were in the worst spots of major cities, Chicago, New York, Newark, Newark, New Jersey, Camden, New Jersey. You don't even know about those places. 
And uh, our job was to go into the, the worst ghettos and preach the gospel and bring them into the tent. So they'd get saved and healed and delivered. So we'd help them along the way, get saved and healed and delivered. I remember one fellow, this was in Harlem, New York. He, uh, he got saved and delivered and he's so fired up, he pulled out his crack cocaine out of his pocket. Crack pipe and crack cocaine, threw it on and started dancing on top of it. <laughs> I'm thinking, where's the hope the cops don't see him? <laughs> But I'm just saying, we, and I didn't have even one bit of fear, or intimidation, or dread. And I'd tell testimonies, and people were like, oh, you better be careful in those places. Oh, you, ha you haven't seen my guardian angel. <laughs> and we would go in those places, and, and, you know, where we knew guns were, crack houses, and we'd go in those places without a care in the world except to, to help hurting people. And we'd go in there with the gospel, and, and the, the little groups of gangs would come over, or we'd go to them. And they'd be like, they'd be looking into it. Well, what's going on? And we'd be loving people and praying for people and sharing the good news with people. And they'd be shaking our hands saying, thank you so much for coming here. Thank you so much for coming here. You know, they ain't so bad after all. They're just more hurt than you, that's all. You know, dirty, hurt, dirty wicked people are just more hurt than you, really. And so you go in there like that and it changes the whole atmosphere, the whole place. Everywhere we went with R.W. Schambach in the inner cities, they say that crime went down to almost nothing in that area. You bring some goodness in, it changes the evil. You start hammering on evil, you know, give me your gun, and they'll give you the gun. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. I just want you to see this term. It says, since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written. Now here is what the spirit of faith is. I believed and therefore I spoke. Mm -hmm. We also believe and therefore speak. Yes. Lord. So what is the spirit of faith? Or let's say it this way. What is the attitude of faith? What is the principle of faith? What's the method of faith? Believe and speak. That's how you make miracles. You believe something and you speak something. You might have to do it a few times. No requirement necessarily, except you have to be 100% convinced. And sometimes it takes you saying it over and over until you're 100% convinced. Hallelujah. Turn to Mark eleven twenty three. Mark eleven twenty three. You know, we get into this stuff and, and we walk with God a while and, and then something goes wrong and um, the first thought is dread. Mm -hmm. Oh no. The second thought is, what have I done? Mm -hmm. The third thought is, oh yes, I remember now, I've done lots of things. Mm -hmm. And oh yes, I remember I haven't done lots of other things. And so the complexities of our soul begin to hinder our progress with God. They hinder our faith walk. They hinder us from receiving because we've got these issues of guilt, issues of neglect, issues of relationship with God. That's why the blood of Jesus is so vital for us to understand because you are made right with God and accepted with God minus all of your complexities. So all those reasonings that we do in our brain hinder us from the miracle. Yes. Well, maybe this is the way that God wants to bless me. Maybe, he, maybe it's not going to be a miracle this time. Maybe, maybe, and we just figure all sorts of weird things up. I've seen people ruin the blessing of God and the miracle of God and their own faith by taking second best and thinking, well, I guess maybe this is the way that God wants to do it this time. No, no. And so then they're wandering around asking God, why, what, me, uh, what have I done, not done, I'm not so sure. And, and then, and what do I do, God? What do I do? He, he's in heaven the whole time. And you can't hear him because you're so, you're so into your own brain. And you can't hear him, but if you could hear him, he'd be up in heaven saying, Believe, 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 and receive it, and receive it, and receive it. No, no, I want to do a miracle for you. A miracle. Receive it. Say it out loud. Say it longer. Say it out loud. Say it longer. Come on. Glory, come on. Yeah. No, it's all for you. It's all for you. It's all for you. 
Don't back down. Don't back down. Just say it a little bit longer. Say it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Keep going. Yeah. Miracles happen this way. Isn't that right? Sometimes it's just a matter of a little simple prayer. Just a simple prayer sometimes is all you need. But you'll know in your heart if that's all you needed. I remember one time I was uh, walking around at night praying. And at the time I was driving an old Suburban. I needed a Suburban. had lots of stuff to carry around and all that. But I, I, I was driving an old Suburban and, and I was out praying and then the Holy Spirit just prompted me. And He said, just in my spirit I recognized, you know what, I'm going to need a new Suburban eventually. Or soon. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to ask Him for it now. No sense waiting until emergency to get a miracle. Come on. So I just said, okay, Lord, I'm going to ask you for a new Suburban in Jesus' name. Or not necessarily new, but better, you know. And so I did. I received it that night in prayer. I, I said, okay, I'll receive it from you. Better. You said anything that I asked the Father in, in Jesus' name, he'd give it to me. So I ask you for it, and I receive it, and now you've given it to me. Thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that was it. That was in the summer. Well, several months go by, and I forgot all about doing that. I forgot all about doing that. And then something came along, and uh, my family, they had some property in Louisiana, and they cut the timber off of it. You know what that means. That means cash. So they cut the timber and sold it and divided it between the eight kids. Well, my parents got some. And they said, hey, Chad, we're going to half this with you. It's like 10000 bucks or something. We're going to half this with you. And I thought, no, 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 that's yours. That's your money. Sometimes we have a hard time actually getting God to give us a miracle. We feel so unworthy, so carnal. And so they're like, no, no, we want to give this to you. We'll half it. I'm like, no, no, y'all can use it. Can, I'm fine. Y'all can use it. And they said, no, 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 we're going to half it with you. Amen. And I thought, okay. <laughs> and I thought to myself, wait a second. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead and give it to me. Because God said he was going to get me a Suburban. That's right. And so I had some money, and I went out looking. And I'm driving around looking, and I passed by this one dealership, and this white Suburban yelled out at me. <laughs> and I thought, I drove up there, and I thought, man, that's a fine-looking thing. I don't know if I can afford that thing. And so I drove up and looked inside. I thought, I don't know if, I don't know if it's going to be for me or not. And I looked in it, and it had blue, it had, it was fine-looking. It had dark blue leather. Mm. Now, some of you may cock your head at me. <laughs> blue leather. But that, I liked blue leather. Amen. Till I got married. Till I got married. Then, you, know, you know how us husbands are. We get new styles after we get married, right? <laughs> we get all fixed up and, and get new style. <laughs> we thought we were doing well, and then we got married and realized we weren't. We thought she liked the way we look, and then all of a sudden we find out, nope, nope, nope. It was the promise of what we could look like. <laughs> and, uh, and I looked in there, I thought, blue leather, that is, that's like my fourth truck to have blue leather in it. I counted it up this morning because I thought about telling this story. And uh, I looked in there and saw that, and I thought, this is the, tr this is the one for me. I didn't even look at the price. I didn't want to look at the price. It'd scare me. <laughs> and so I went up to the sales guy and I told him, I said, here, I have, I think I offered him 11, 5 or something like that. And I had some extra money uh, somehow. I don't know. And so I offered him something like 11, 5 or something like that. I'm thinking, I don't know what it cost. Turned out it cost like 14 or 13, 9 or something like that. So I just offered it and he took it just like that. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It was a perfect vehicle for a while. It was excellent, and I thank my God for it. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. One thing you have to know in the asking of God, you have to know when to get specific and when not to. Yes. Sometimes people are so just ridiculous about what they want and how specific they want to get. They just take themselves right because they know they can't get that, and so they just pressure themselves with this perfect thing that they're trusting God for. Sometimes you need to stay general. I just wanted a suburban. And if you'll do it right, then God will give you the desires of your heart. Amen. If you'll do it right, He'll give you the desires of your heart. He knows what you want. Sometimes you need to be specific, but those moments you need to also remember, if you're going to get real specific, you need some extra leading of the Spirit. You need some extra unction inside you. You need to know how specific you can get. The Holy Spirit will help you pray. He'll lead you in praying even.
But you're going to have to be sensitive to that and know how far to go. Hear something from God or at least know what He'll allow you to ask for. Amen? Amen. I mean, if it wasn't for something like that, then we could all just sit here and say, well, I'd like to have $2 million tomorrow. <laughs> and none of you could trust God for that. Unless there's a businessman in here who's been trusting God for a, a venture or an investment so that he can produce something and go... See what I mean? Yeah. Some people could believe for two million bucks. Yeah. But they'd need to follow the Holy Spirit and the timing and all that. Yeah. Amen? So sometimes a prayer will solve it. Other times you're going to have to say, if it's an issue in life, if it's an obstacle, if it's a hindrance, if it's an affliction, a sickness, a disease, if it's a torment, if it's a demon, if it's a depression, you're going to have to do something different yeah. than just walk around asking God. When it comes to devils and depressions and sicknesses, God never said, well, just, just pray more. Mm -hmm. nope. That's right. Mm -hmm. Keep going. That's right. Come on. Never did he say that. Yeah. Jesus never prayed for devils to leave people. No. Nope. He, Amen. he forced it to happen. Amen. We'll talk about that next time, enforcing the will of God. But I want to read you this one scripture again, Mark eleven twenty three, or verse 22. Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, just stop there for a second. Here we're going to talk about the mountain. Now every Christian who's read the, any of the Bible has thought about the mountain and understood the mountain a little bit. Recognize that the mountain could be removed. But most people think God removes mountains. Is that how you think in your own soul that God removes mountains? Let's, let's get more precise with it. We're going to read this passage. See, see if God moved any mountain here. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things which he says will come to pass, he will have whatever he says. Notice it doesn't say pray to God that the mountain go away. It says that Whoever believes will say to the mountain. Right. Yep. Whosoever shall say to the mountain. Mm -hmm. yeah. How does the Christian move a mountain? He speaks to it. Tells it where to go. And does not doubt in his heart. Uh -huh. Now some mountains, I mean... If you went out to a physical mountain, you'd have to leave Houston to find one. Mm -hmm. But if you went out to a physical mountain, it would look pretty big. It's like, how in the world could I move that thing? So we kind of drift away from that example. But I, I used to spend ample time thinking about it. Mm -hmm. I would picture, what if there was a mountain? And my family was on the other side, about to die. And the only way was to move the mountain. Could I do it? And I would put myself in Scripture and I would think, wait, he said I could, he said I could, he said I would, he said if I say, he said if I say, I would, I would be able. So I, I would picture in my mind being able to do something like that. Mm -hmm. Now you may think that's crazy, but that's how I practice myself. That's how I develop my faith muscle. Yes. That's how I learn. That's how I image, imagine things. But then the Christian has a headache or a fever or a pain or a scary pain. And whoosh! Instant mountain in the soul. Mm -hmm. Come on. Yeah. You ever had some weird pain? Oh, yeah. Instant mountain in the soul. What do you do? I mean, this is serious business. This is serious business. This is get away from everybody. I got to I got to handle business right here. The first thing you do is you don't get on the phone and call your sister. You don't get on the phone and call all your people. You know what the doctor said? You know what the doctor said? You with me? That's the world's way. Our faith overcomes this world. Our faith, our faith can bring the world to its knees. Our faith can bring the doctor's report to his knees. But you're going to have to mean it. You're going to have to buckle up. You're going to have to get ready. I mean, when football players play, play football, I mean, they get in a stance so that they can hit that sucker. Can I say sucker in church? I just did. <laughs> if you're about to take a hit or if you're about to hit somebody, you better get ready for that thing. You better get some stance going. Spiritually, Christians need a stance before you speak to a mountain. Spiritually, you need to, you, need to, you know, recognize, okay, here, here it is. It's me and you. 
Somebody's fallen. Somebody's going to the sea and it ain't me. Amen. <laughs> You've heard me tell the story I threw a headache in, the, in Lake Conroe one day. Just like that, it left. I felt it. A hole opened up in my head and it tingled out and it was gone. I believe that scripture. The Holy Spirit prompted me. He said, just cast it in the lake. And so I did. And so I started thinking, uh, you know, I'm no dummy. I can read the Bible and I can see how things work and start using it. So I started thinking, well, maybe the secret is water. There's some water around. You know, God puts your sins in the sea of forgetfulness. Maybe there's something to do with how invisible things get once you cast it in water. Disappeared. The axe head, bloop, gone. Right? Right. So I started thinking, if I can just find a body of water, I can get healed every time. So I started, I'd fill up the sink. One time I, felt, I filled up the kitchen sink, cast my problem in there, and there it went. I found a toilet had water in it, cast it in the toilet. One time, I didn't want to take any time to go look for any other water. I just filled up a glass of water and threw the problem in the glass of water. And it worked all three times. All three of those things worked, I remember. The natural Christian looks at that and says, that's ridiculous, I'm going home to watch baseball. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the spiritual Christian says, I'm going I'm to make it work for me. Yeah. Not, I hope it works for me, but I'm going to make it work for me next time. Amen. You're going to have to take a word of God and make it work for you. Amen. You're going to have to take a word of God and settle it for your own self Amen. so it'll come to pass in the earth, whatever the case may be. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh -huh.